Good morning and welcome to St. Andrew's Church this morning and a very special welcome to anyone who's visiting here today. Uh, please feel free to sign the visitor's book as you leave. There will be a joint meeting of St. Andrew's and Brightkirk Session and Board in Church on Thursday the 21st of October at 7pm. The minutes will be mailed out sometime this week. A reminder that the hearing aid clinic will be in the hall on Tuesday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Booking is still by appointment, and you can get contact de details from the notice board in the hall. Operation Christmas Child. For anyone wishing to fill a box, there are some pre-printed boxes in the hall, or speak to Christine and Eileen, who are in the church today. Saturday, the 6th of November, there will be a craft table top, a bleak car boot sale fundraiser in the church, uh, in the church hall and car park. Anyone wishing to book a space can contact Eileen Usher or find details on the church website. Shoebox parking, there will be an event on Saturday the 13th of November at 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Come along if you would like to help. St Andrew's Church Hall is a collection point for the area for the filled boxes. The boxes can be dropped off week commencing the 15th of November. The times will be advised later. And I believe, Eileen, you have quiz sheets for sale today. They're at the front door. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your mercy to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you that you, though God, though almighty, though King of kings and Lord of lords, look upon your creation with love, a love that bubbles up and overflows into this reality. We thank you that that overflowing is found in Jesus Christ as he gives himself to us in service. <coughs> We thank you for that great example that we have of your love for us that reaches beyond the bounds of what is possible. Even though we are rebels, sinners, enemies of the kingdom, you draw us close to you. You cause us to be your family. You make us heirs with Christ. Oh Lord, this is your great gift to us this morning. <coughs> and as we come to you in service, this time of worship, this work of liturgy, the work of the people, we praise you for your goodness and your mercy to us. Lord, we recognize that we are not deserving. We recognize that we have failed you and failed one another <coughs> in our thoughts, our words, our deeds. Lord, we recognize that you came not to condemn, but to convict. That we would turn to you and ask your forgiveness. And you have promised that in asking, we will find peace. We will be forgiven. Oh 
Lord God, help us to be free of guilt this morning. That in not being condemned and receiving the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we would look to live out our thankfulness to you in service to one another. Even as you have done to those who stand against you, those who profess to hate you. O Lord, send your Holy Spirit among us. As you descend, lift us up. As we pray, we join together to say the words that Jesus gave us to use. Our Father, Amen. Our reading for today comes, oh sorry, we're going to sing. Uh, All people that on earth do dwell. Hmm? Oh Jesus, I have promised.
Our reading today comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 to 17. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. Let us pray together. Almighty God, in your love, open our hearts and our minds to understand your word written and read to us, to take it in, to abide in Christ, and know your way for us in mission and in service. Amen. <laughs> <coughs> My apologies for the cough. I'm afraid sometime this week I've picked up a cold. It's not COVID. I've tested it a billion times now. We're fine. But As we um, uh, continue in our, our series on the five marks of missions, we are going to look at TEND today, which is the, the third of these marks. We've already looked at TELL. Uh, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, transform, transforming unjust structures of society, and treasure, which is looking after the integrity of creation. <coughs> Teachers to come, which is next week, which is to teach, baptize, and, and nurture believers. But this week, we're going to look at tend, which means to respond to human need by loving service. It's an interesting one at the moment, looking after people in, in, in loving service. It's one that's challenged very often by our society, is one that doesn't happen that much. Um, and certainly if you go onto the internet, you can find many examples of um, videos of people testing this as they uh, challenge maybe uh, women. Uh, to see whether they're interested in men by virtue of the fancy car that they're stood next to or, or their, their own uh, um, character and, and life. Or maybe um, to test people uh, about whether they wish to um, take money uh, from someone uh, and give it uh, to a homeless person in one of these, these tests. Um, the one that I'm most interested in today and I've picked as the illustration is one that's been told many times, um, actually. And it's, it's, its origin is lost in myth. But by this point, I'm absolutely certain some minister somewhere has done this, which is to prepare for a service by growing their hair long, their beard out, um, becoming generally disheveled, covering themselves in mud, wearing old clothes, and sitting on the doorstep of the church as the congregants come in to see if anyone responds in love. And then, of course, wandering in. And as these uh, stories often go, because they have to have a punch to them, no one has responded to the homeless person on the step. And lo, t'was the minister. And so aren't you all feeling convicted now? It's the ultimate uh, mystery shopper experience 
to see whether Christians are really doing what they profess to be doing. The reality is, I think, quite positive. I think most of us are looking after people around about us as much as we are able to do so. And I didn't need to uh, dress up as a homeless person this morning in order to challenge you because we had and have had situations like that in our church over the previous years. Um, but even a couple of weeks ago, someone ended up sleeping in the, the uh, uh, little sheltered seating outside Brightkirk Church, and there were members of the congregation who stopped to find out who he was and what was happening. And even when this guy had left to put his belongings into the police station so he could pick them up later. There are plenty of opportunities to do uh, what is right and what is good. <coughs> it's one of the strong points of us as Christians and of us as a Christian people and nation. It's out of our, our Christianity that our, our nation exhibits principles of social justice and societal ordering of rehabilitation uh, for prisoners, um, of uh, welfare for those in need, of the NHS, so that uh, we don't have to bear the brunt of each other's illnesses. Unlike places like America and Japan, where many films are written and made of situations where people can't afford to pay for health care that we receive freely. We have a principle in our nation of looking after the weakest among us, not just helping short term or abandoning them to survive. And having traveled around the world a little bit, I've noticed in places, I'm sure many of you will have done, uh, the numbers of people that you see in other cities and, and towns that are at the mercy of the church and others around them where welfare hasn't been set up for them. We are, as Christians, called to tend, to look after one another, to, to, again, as we have already discussed in mission, to find out what God's already doing and to join in with it as God continues to do these marks of mission towards us. To some degree, each of the marks that we've seen so far are to do with relationships. They're to do with how God acts towards us and how we are to act towards one another. Um, this mark, uh, uh, probably the most to do with relationships as we proclaim with our actions our loving service. Jesus himself was the, the perfect example of this, the one who reached out to all segments of society in which he found himself. He hung out with a quite a varied group of individuals, all the wrong folks, you know, uh, the, uh, not the authorities and the wonder makers of the day, but time after time he was called out by the great and good for having met with the sinners of the day, the broken people, uh, the people who were outcast by society like the tax collectors operating for the Romans or those who had leprosy or those who were sick and left at a pool in order to wait for the waters to be stirred up so they could jump in themselves. People who had no one else. People who were demon-possessed. All sorts. And Jesus goes, he sees their need and he responds. Or they bring their need and he responds. We are, are called two in the same way. Um, it's lovely, out of that reading, well, it's a bit strange, I suppose, that the allusion to Cain, but the thing that sticks out for me most is the idea that the whole of human, the human race comes from uh, Cain, who killed his brother Abel. Uh, we are all descended from a murderer, the first murderer in creation. It's a wonderful thought that God didn't erase that line and instead kept the righteous Abel. 
No, he kept the line of brokenness into which he acts as Christ. We are called out of our brokenness to act and help those experiencing brokenness themselves, to care about our neighbours, to look not to the far-off needs, although that's well and good, but the needs that are right next to us, the people in the pews next to us, the people who live next door to you, the people who you pass on the streets. To do what Christ did, to show love by opening his heart and spreading his arms wide to embrace the world. It's a challenge to us, I think, how it's put. Um, It's very easy for us to love those who love us. It's much more difficult to love those who hate us. And it's that angle specifically that I wanted to pick up um, on this morning. Um, We see Jesus talking about this in in Luke's gospel. He says, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive them as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expect nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you'll be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as our Father is merciful. We see it too in the the story of the Good Samaritan, don't we, which I'm sure you all know very well, the man on the road to Jericho who ends up beaten and bloodied, lying in a ditch, And who is it that passes by but the good, the people that should be his friends, the church? And who is it that stops and helps him? Well, it's his enemy, the Samaritan, despised and reviled in their society, at war uh, with those of Israel, those of Jerusalem. So we find ourselves asking again that question, you know, what does this mark of mission look like in our lives? What might it look like to serve daily in loving service? And yes, sometimes it means giving money, all good. Yes, it may mean getting involved in organizations like perhaps Kate's Kitchen. Yeah, great. But what does it mean for for us in our our daily living to tend to respond to human need by loving service? And I think fundamentally it comes down to the calling to leave our comfort zones. To recognize what those are and to attempt as best we can to step out of them. God is working around you. Scripture tells us he goes before us. God is working around you. Are you prepared to work with him? To step into those places where it is difficult? I think in order to identify this at first, we need to be looking. We need to be trying to spot where God is working at home where he's working in our schools or in our communities, in our jobs. How is Christ present and how can we join in with what he's doing? It would be a completely different world, I think, if we took up that idea of tending each other on that basis. What could we do, not just for those we love, but for those we dislike, maybe even those we hate, What can we do? Though we're all uh, pretty lovely people, I think we can stop and spend a bit of time and and think about who it is that we struggle with. And, uh, you know, even though we are lovely people, I mean, it could be even our politicians. Uh, I won't name particular names, but we might struggle with some of them. And we might want their heads on platters sometimes. 
What can we do to help them? What can we do to serve them? Of the people we hate, of the people we dislike, what can we do to serve them? The five marks of mission at their essence are about making um, something that is comprised of both action and proclamation, two things coming together. Like we were talking about when we covered James's uh, letter, um, it's both things at once. We, yes, we absolutely need to talk about what we're doing, but we absolutely also need to do something as well. And our, our task as Christians is to, to journey outwards, to embrace the stranger, uh, to work for social peace and justice as we partake of God's gracious gift of salvation and grace, to do as God has done to us. Very often we can focus just on the eternal aspects of faith, and that's good, but it's not enough because it should lead us to act. Too often we can just go for acting, and that's not enough. We need to be able to proclaim as well, to speak the gospel too, to tell people why it is that we do these things. Jesus, who spoke, is someone also who agonized and bled and sweat and cried with those around him. I wanted to uh, leave you with a, a quote for today from the Archbishop William Temple, who was born in 1881 in uh, England. And he, he grew up to be a philosopher and statesman. He was someone who supported social reform and defined, defended the, the working classes. Um, he was a pioneer in the ecumenical movement, and he, he stood up in 1943 in the Houses of Parliament and spoke passionately against the slaughter of Jews by the Nazis, arguing for their protection and making it a priority for the Allies. And he compared the Allies at the present to have been like the priest and the Levite who passed by on the other side. He wanted to, the people to know that even in the, the turbulent times of those days, maybe even for us in the turbulent times of these days, that the church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. That's the quote. The church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. And it's the same for us as Christians now. It is the same, hopefully, that the church would be operating out of that basis, but it's the same for God. That God stepped down from all the riches of heaven in Christ for those who were his enemies, us, to draw us close. What is God calling you today as you live in service? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for that work that you have done in Jesus Christ. We thank you that you show us a way um, that goes well beyond what is normal for us as human beings to do. And it is indeed part, a big part, of why our society has operated the way it has done. Why such a tiny island has become a great force in the world. Lord, we thank you that you call us to participate in your work. We thank you that you have promised us all the gifts and abilities we need to be able to carry out that work. And we pray now that you would help us to consider those around about us. Not to be reactive, but proactive. What can we do. Lord, I pray that as we consider these things, we take up seriously that question this week for those we hate and those we dislike. That maybe you would help us to consider to hold them in our minds and work out ways that we can support them. (laughs) 
Lord, help us to be willing to consider these things so that when opportunities where you are working appear before us, we can jump in with both feet in gratitude and service to you. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue considering these things, we're going to uh, sing again, um, which I'm told is, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Uh, let's stand and sing. Please be seated and let us take some time to pray together. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, yes, we do ask for those crystal fountains to be opened and all your blessings poured out. We thank you that we live in such a time as this, that we are the ones to receive your blessings now. We thank you for your great goodness to us. We thank you for your mercy to us. We thank you that even though it may feel dark around about us, you are already working, already doing, already giving us exactly what we need for this time. Oh Lord God, we thank you for Jesus Christ who is the right person in the right time, the right place, to be the salvation for this world through all generations, past, present, and future. We thank you that in him the full disclosure of yourself was made, 
We thank you that through his life, death, and resurrection, we are reconciled and brought to peace with you and with one another. Lord, as you have given yourself, help us now to give of ourselves. As we apportion to you some of what we are, our time, our talents, our treasure, we place ourselves into your hands. We ask that you would bless us and bless your church for the increase of your kingdom here in Annan and its environs, across Scotland and around your world. Oh Lord, let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. As we give you thanks, as we pray that we would be of use, we also bring before you our prayers for our world and for others recognizing this as the greatest work that you have given us to do. Lord, we remember with sorrow in our hearts that which we've seen over this week, or heard of, or read, from this beautiful world of ours, of the horror of human violence, of the power of natural disaster, of the tragedy of accident and error, of the pride of our willfulness to decide our own way regardless of who it hurts and what it costs. Oh Lord, we recognize again that this world is not as you intended it to be. We ask for your grace, your mercy. We ask for your wisdom for our leaders. We ask for peace among the nations. We ask for healing and restoration for those who have been broken by natural disaster. We ask for restoration for those forced out of their countries and their homes. And most of all, Lord, we ask for comfort today for those grieving the loss of friends and family. Oh Lord, we we barely understand all that happens. We cannot go everywhere, we cannot be responsible for it all, but we know, Lord, that you can go where we cannot, and we can offer you our prayers, and you have promised that you will answer. Lord, as we think of nations around the world, we pray for our own lands, and we ask for those who govern us, whether it's from our monarchy, through our governments, our parliaments, right the way down to those of local councils, even people of our our schools, our teachers, our law enforcement. Lord, we ask that the hallmark of people such as this would be a wisdom that is not their own, but one of heaven, one that seeks the best for those around about them. Lord, we think of this particularly in the the turmoil for people that have been going on as as universal credit is changed again. One, no doubt, of many changes to come. Father, we recognize that you are already working our lands. We pray that your kingdom would be manifest here that your will would be done, that this land would again be wholly yours, that all the good that has come before us would not be squandered in our own selfishness. 
Lord, we pray for our own area here, the churches of this town, the businesses, the streets. And we remember again that, that the phrase of Archbishop Temples that we are concerned with those who are not our membership. So we pray too for our parish, for those we do not know. Asking, Lord, that you would help us to serve where we can. But whether we can or not, to bring release, Lord, to those imprisoned, healing to those who are sick, life in the midst of death and grief, company into loneliness, stability into mental health, purpose for the lost. Though we walk through that valley of the shadow of death, you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. So Lord, we take some time to pray, maybe for ourselves, maybe for people we do know, to name them to you directly. All of this we pray in and through the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, whose hands flung stars into space and were pierced by cruel nails who lift us up from the darkest depths and into glory welcomes us. Amen. We're going to sing our final song for our time together, although it is our continuing of worship out into the world, our everlasting God as we celebrate who God is.
May the strength of God sustain you, the power of God preserve you, the hands of God protect you, and the way of God direct you. May the love of God go with you this day and forever. May that blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and remain with each of you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.